Hola to everyone at Dissident Fest 2021 in Barcelona. And adab and hello to everyone else in every time zone across the world who might be listening in. My name is Anasya Sengupta and I'm the co-founder and co-director of Whose Knowledge, a global multilingual campaign and feminist collective to center the knowledges of marginalized communities online. Or as we like to remind everyone, the minoritized majority of the world. It's my honor and privilege to be speaking to you all today on the ways that we understand the intersections of democracy, social justice, and of course, technology. So I'm going to talk you through some of the practices and possibilities of the ways that we do our work. But before that, I want to set a little context for how and why we do the work we do. First, a little context of who's online and how they're online, knowledge infrastructures. So over 60% of the world is now online. And of course, that is in very different ways. Um, most people are online through mobile phones rather than those of us who are much more privileged, who have a PC of our own and can use browsers with ease. Um, but of those who are online, who are virtually connected, three-fourths are from the Global South from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, and the Pacific and Caribbean islands. 48% of all women are now online. And yet, the leadership positions in the tech sectors, in those who uh, architect, design, and govern our network infrastructures are, of course, woefully still white men. So 5% of all leadership positions in the technology sector are held by women. And in the USA, only 5% of those who hold any kind of computing role are Asian, 3% are black, and only 1% is Hispanic. And if you look at tech workers at Apple, only 6% are black. And of course, it's far worse at Facebook and Google. If you look at governance in particular and uh, some of the institutions that are part of our network infrastructures, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, for instance, most of the documentation, most of the thinking comes out of Europe and North America. And at the last in-person IETF meeting, only six participants were from Africa. And similarly for ICANN, the nonprofit that governs our domain names, only 27% of participants at the 2019 ICANN meeting were women. In other words, those who uh, essentially are at the core of the design architecture and governance of the internet and of our knowledge infrastructures do not look, sound, or feel like most of us in the world. So what does this mean for the ways that we understand knowledge injustices? Our friends at Google did a, a projection a few years ago to understand what uh, and how many books were published in which languages. And they projected that there had been a, about 130 million books published in only about 480 languages. And as I like to call them, Eurolingual languages. And yet there are over 7,000 languages in the world. And for any one of us who is bilingual or multilingual, as I think many of you listening in to this festival are, we know that when we speak in a particular language, we are thinking, doing, and being differently than when we speak in a different language. When we are speaking and thinking and doing in Catalan, it is different from the way that we speak, think and speak and do in Spanish or in English or in any other language of the world. And so if you do a back of the envelope calculation uh, with language as a proxy for knowledge, only about 7% of the world's knowledge is actually captured in what we think of as published material or books. Most online content in the world today is in English with Russian a very trailing second. Most users come online in English and then of course after that in Chinese. And most importantly, most academic journals in social sciences or in the sciences are predominantly in English. In other words, content and what we might think of as knowledge 
online, public online knowledge is predominantly monolingual and thereby in many ways monocultural. I just did a little bit of digging into the UK where I happen to sit. And of course that is ironic as an Indian sitting in the land of my colonial masters. But therefore this research really was both unsurprising and horrifying simultaneously. Of all the academics in the UK, there are just 140 black professors out of 21,000. 68% of all professors are white men. In other words, there are only 25 full professors who are black women. And that extends to the resources available to non-white uh, students and to the governance of the education sector in the UK. I would urge all of you to do a little bit of digging into your context in your countries and see what form of power and privilege is dominant there. In other words, whose knowledge is online and in the world? Published and online knowledge, scholarship and scholars do not read, look or sound like the majority of the world, like most of us in the world. That is why at Whose Knowledge we think about decolonizing the internet and decolonizing knowledge. What does that really mean? It means we start from the radical notion that people are knowledges, that really so much of the world's knowledge is oral, oral and experiential and embodied rather than in sort of formal artifacts of the book and of published material. And how do we then express that online, on the internet, which gives us the promise of a democratic emancipatory space that really is one of the few uh, and possibly only global infrastructure, global technical infrastructure that can mimic embodiment, that can look and sound and feel like most of us in the world. And yet, of course, is still not that. So, I'm going to use Wikipedia and the Wikimedia movement because I, as a Wikipedian and a Wikimedian, um, feel very strongly about it. I uh, love it. I uh, respect it. I am so humbled and um, overwhelmed by all that it has done in the 20 years that it has been alive. And yet, I also critique it from a position of tough love. So because it's an excellent proxy for what we think of as online participatory knowledge and a form of online participatory democracy, we know that it is the largest free knowledge set of projects in history. It doesn't take ads, it is as far as possible not influenced by the large uh, tech uh, actors in the world, um, though of course we can talk that through a little more. It has over 300 active language Wikipedias, even if only about 100 have substantive content. Uh, over a billion unique devices visit every month, any of its uh, sites. And yet, only 10% of Wikipedia editors are women or non-binary folks, as we estimated. And only about 20% of the public knowledge online on Wikipedia is produced on or by people from the global south. So how participatory, how global really is Wikipedia? In 2012, Mark Graham and his team at the Oxford Internet Institute did this mapping of geotagged uh, articles on Wikipedia and found that there were more articles within the little tiny circle of Western Europe than across the rest of the world. In 2018, they came back to this, did a slightly more detailed form of data visualization and the, uh, the outlook had improved uh, no, with, with a lot of effort from a great many Wikimedians across the world. Um, and yet, as you can see, the map still shows such great uh, invisibility for most of us in the world. 
This is also true of gender. Uh, if you look at all the different language Wikipedias, uh, of all the biographies of people, uh, only about a fourth are those of women. Uh, on the English Wikipedia, it's just 18% of all biographies being of women. And this, of course, is after, again, tremendous efforts by many of us in the movement. And then if you look at that invisibility, it is heightened by the fact that of all those biographies of women, only a fourth have images. So we don't even see the incredible women, non-binary, genderqueer folks that we celebrate uh, on Wikipedia. And of course, there's so much more to do. So in fact, we run something called Visible Wiki Women, which I will come back to. But why does Wikipedia and Wikimedia matter so much uh, to all of us who think about forms of participatory democracy and online public knowledge? Because it is one of the fewest, one of the few um, free and open knowledge projects of its kind, and of course the largest, it is used by many third party content providers like Google. So your search engine, your knowledge graph will uh, show up content from Wikipedia, Siri and Alexa are constantly using Wikidata and um, other forms of information from Wikipedia and its sister projects. And so inequities, gaps in representation, but also gaps in ways of knowing and being in the world spread across the internet when they are also in Wikipedia and Wikimedia projects. So, Let's look at Wikimedia and the movement as a participatory democracy, which it is in many ways. It's, it's a celebration of a global uh, online knowledge project where those who are both online and those who are offline who embody uh, the work of organizing communities around the world around Wikipedia and its projects, sincerely and strongly feel that anybody can edit. It's very similar to the ways we think about democracy and electoral democracy. After all, anybody can vote. But really, is that true? When we start to look at the way that power and privilege have historically and continue to structure the ways we experience our lives on the continuum between the offline and the online, we have to stop a little and start asking ourselves some tough questions. So in the Wikipedia case, for instance, we know that even though anybody can technically edit, women, people of color, those from uh, non-English speaking backgrounds, those who speak English uh, differently than those in Europe or North America, find it far more difficult to be on Wikipedia and to um, make their edits count than those who come uh, primarily from a privileged background within the global north. And even within the global north, those who come from uh, a different class uh, or uh, race or uh, sexuality background, uh, a different uh, ability, uh, a different language, they too find it enormously difficult to be on Wikipedia in quite the same embodied and joyful way as uh, most of its longest serving editors. Even when you think about Wikimedia uh, as an offline project, as the community organizers around the world who are extraordinary, all my friends, as you can see from this joyful um, Berlin photograph, uh, yet despite all of our efforts, still at the core of organizing and governance in the Wikimedia movement are those from the Global North and um, those who are primarily women, uh, primarily men. Um, and so that again makes us ask ourselves, what does participatory democracy really mean in practice? I would like to remind us all of Jo Freeman, the feminist um, sort of exhortation to us, where she said, remember that even in a circle, there is power. Not everyone is equal in the same way in a circle. So, for us at Whose Knowledge, we then ask ourselves the question, can we reframe the notion of participatory democracy to be and do radical democracy? 
and what does that mean? For us, I'm going to talk through some principles and practices and the ways we think about these issues, uh, once again, reminding us of these critical intersections and interlockings of um, democracy, technology, and global justice. So we at Whose Knowledge are rooted in a power analysis. When we think about power, we recognize that in any particular context, in a situated context, we have to ask ourselves constantly the questions, who does what, who gets what, who sets the agenda, and who decides what. And it particularly means as you move from the individual to the group to the system and the structure that we are asking ourselves whose story, what is the story, who is the storyteller and curator. And as we think about what these mean in, in, in experience, in practice, whose knowledge is it, whose experience is it, whose internet is it, whose democracy is it. And ultimately, all of this is rooted in whose design, imagination, and leadership the systems of power and digital experience and the continuum between the digital and the physical it is. We also remind ourselves that power is dynamic and intersectional. It is not simply that our status of power and positionality is the same in all contexts at all times. If I have to take myself, for instance, I might often be the only brown woman speaking about technology and knowledge in a particular global North context. And yet when I'm back home in India, I am a Saverna uh, or upper caste woman who is very much part of uh, a system of oppression that has subjugated Dalit um, and Bahujan uh, folks for centuries and millennia in an extremely oppressive caste system. So I have privilege from caste, I have privilege from education, I have privilege from being urban and English speaking, and yet in other contexts, I feel like I'm on the margins of the world looking in. I feel like misogyny and racism and the structures of power and privilege that separate those from the global north and the global south are constantly working against my favor. So just in my own embodied experience, I know that in different contexts, I experience power and privilege and dispower and disprivilege differently. And of course, that is true when we think about the intersections of colonization and capitalism, patriarchy, racism, homophobia, and all of these different forms of othering in the ways that we experience the world, whether on the streets of uh, Barcelona or online on the internet. So um, I'm going to go forward uh, to explain a little bit of what this means in tangible and intangible ways. Why is it that we root uh, the ways we think about power in a very specific understanding of colonization? Because we think that beyond patriarchy, which is probably the oldest system of oppression we have, um, colonization over the last 400 years and or so has had the most profound understanding on the ways that we experience life on the in the on the ways in which we are seen and unseen known and unknown what things we can and can't do and most importantly on our mind in the ways that we imagine and so if I have to look at uh, India, just as an example, one of the uh, most wonderful feminist economists out of India did an excellent um, analysis a few years ago, where she found that $45 trillion had been siphoned out of India over the 200 years of the British Empire. And that means essentially, when you look at things like life expectancy and, of course, all the mythologies around colonization. But of course, Britain gave India the trains. Why did they give them to trains? Not because they were being benevolent um, dictators, but because they were sending armies to quell the insurrections and revolts and mutinies that um, uh, were breaking out across the subcontinent. So when you look at both the money as well as the resources of human beings, their bodies and their minds, 
Britain didn't develop India, India developed Britain, um, as uh, many of my colleagues have, have put it, um, and particularly Jason Hickel, uh, an anthropologist and geographer. Um, and so one of the things I want to remind us all, which is also true of the ways we think about digital colonialism, is that Wakanda is not a possible Afro future when you think about colonization across the global south, across Africa, Asia, and Latin America, it is a possible past. It is what we could have been without empire. And so we need to remember the ways in which colonization continues to affect us into the everyday of our current lives. So racism is, an, is a constructed, uh, byproduct um, and an intentional one of colonization because of course in order to uh, create the rationale for colonization the Europe at that time uh, and its many academics and intellectuals create a construct of race and racism that allows uh, Europeans to think about um, you know uh, civilizing the savage and you know, that's why uh, the church, the state um, and trade all come together in this unholy mix, um, if you like. That's why I'm using the cross as a symbol. Then capitalism comes out of that colonization, of course, because that's how the continuation of history occurs. And there are inequities of capitalism that come out of the histories and inequities of colonization. That then gets embedded in tech capital. Um, why is it that even to this day, so much of tech capital is concentrated in one very small valley in, uh, in California, um, a valley which I happen to have uh, lived near for the last few years of my life. And then how does that translate into the ways we experience the digital? What is digital colonialism? And of course, I have been pointing out some of the ways in which we can see that um, in the ways that we experience uh, both the design, architecture, governance, content, and uh, end user experience of the internet. So we recognize that the work is of reparations and justice, not of representation and solutionism. And I want to say that this is true for knowledge, but it is true for all the many ways in which we understand our world and the ways in which we embody uh, lived experience. Um, it is important for us to recognize that knowledge justice is different from knowledge representation. It isn't just about who is online and what are the knowledge gaps and how do we make sure that we have more um, articles about women and non-binary folks or more articles from the global south. It's about recognizing that we actually think and do differently from different positions and systems of knowledge. And how do we make sure that that form of epistemic on knowledge justice is centered online rather than simply thinking of it as solutionism and gaps. And that is true for the way we think about democracy as well. So I'm going to point out to you uh, one of those very obvious um, sort of uh, frames that are used to say, oh, well, um, we should be thinking about equity rather than in equality. Um, feminists often say equality is not sameness. And here you see uh, one of those uh, examples of the ways that we think about equity. The reason I hate this uh, example is because what it does on the right hand side, even as it is talking about equity, um, and what is very important for all of us to understand is who is centered in this gaze, who is centered in this understanding of equity, because what it shows you is an assumption that there is a level playing field and a level viewing field, and that all we need are these higher boxes, a little bit of help, a little bit of patronage, a little bit of charity for these young children, the infantilized, to be able to see. 
We who are marginalized by historical and ongoing structures of power and privilege are not children. We are sometimes children, but in general, we don't need to be infantilized. We are full human beings. And therefore, if you look at this example, it demonstrates both the inequities in the viewing and the being, you know, how many barriers there are to this, um, this notion of being able to participate fully. And it demonstrates that we are full human beings. We don't need to be infantilized and patronized in order to bring the richness and textures of our lives and our knowledges to the world. So at Whose Knowledge, one of our most important protocols and practices is that how we do our work is as important, if not more important, as what we do. And we center um, all the different communities and extraordinary humans, scholars and activists that we work with. We work collaboratively, co collaboratively with them and ask them to tell us what frames of reference we should be using in our work. So an example of it that uh, you might want to read is a collaboratively written article on centering knowledge, knowledge from the margins called Our Embodied Practices of Epistemic Resistance and Revolution. We also self-published something called Our Stories, Our Knowledges, which is, um, as I like to tell my friends in the Wikimedia movement, our way of creating our own sources and citations. Um, and from it comes this beautiful quote, our knowledges are urgent, they are plural, they are transformative, they are hope. We center the leadership design and imaginations of the marginalized majority of the world. And we remember that this means shifting and changing and transforming power in practice. Decolonization or decolonizing because it's an ongoing process, we never arrive, there is no arrival in this process is about practice. You can use these words, you can make them metaphors, but metaphors will not change our lived experience, only practice does. And so Linda Tuhiwai Smith, the brilliant Maori scholar, tells us to resist and retrench in the margins, to retrieve what we were and to remake ourselves. And Audre Lorde similarly says, define for myself. If we did not self-define, then we would be crunched into other people's fantasies and eaten alive. So for us, centering the imaginations of those of us who have been marginalized is key because we don't just want safety and security as the low bar to being online. We want to experience joy, pleasure, excitement. And for many of us, the internet has given that to us. It has been a place of joy and pleasure. But what does that mean in the fullness of all that we are, in the fullness of all that we can offer the rest of the world? So, uh, as I said, Visible Wiki Women is a way of bringing on the images and the achievements of women and non-binary folks from around the world. We run a sub campaign called Women of Colors, of course, to, uh, to emphasize that Wikipedia doesn't yet have the fullness of uh, this, this great set of achievements and humans from around the world we see scale as a jigsaw puzzle, not a factory. And this is really important as we think about democracy uh, and, and the ways that we practice it. It is not just a growing set of homogenous units. Human beings are not pins and we are not in a pin factory. Uh, we need to see ourselves even in a very two-dimensional way, perhaps not as rich and textured as many other forms of knowledge, we need to see ourselves as growing like a jigsaw puzzle. And so ultimately for us, radical democracy is the notion that no one is free until all of us are free. Once again, no one is free until all of us are free. And as a wonderful feminist lesbian uh, inspiration of mine, Charlotte Bunch says, Revolution is a symphony of liberations. And another extraordinary South African activist um, and leader, Pregs Govinder says, 
It takes love, courage, and insubordination. So I wish us all at Dissident Fest a symphony of liberations through the practice of love, courage, and a little digital insubordination. Thank you all so much. Gracias, shukriya. Thank you for having me. Um, looking forward to speaking with you more over the course of the festival. <laughs>